Hello everyone and welcome to AISC's webinar, Are You Properly Specifying Materials? presented by Charlie Carter. Today is June 16, 2016. My name is Christina Harbour. I am with AISC's Continuing Education Group and I will be moderating today's presentation. I want to introduce today's speaker. Charlie Carter is the Vice President and Chief Structural Engineer for AISC, where he has worked since 1991. He received his Bachelor and Master of Science degrees in Architectural Engineering from Penn State University and his PhD in Civil and Architectural Engineering from the Illinois Institute of Technology. He is a licensed structural engineer and professional engineer in Illinois. Charlie serves as the Secretary of the AISC Committee on the Code of Standard Practice and is a member of many other committees and professional associations related to the design of buildings and steel structures. Welcome, Charlie, and I'll hand things over to you. Thank you, Christina, and thank you all for joining us today as we answer the question, are you properly specifying materials? Those of you who keep up with the information we put in the AISC magazine, Modern Steel Construction, likely are aware of the article shown here and carrying the same title. In fact, most of what I'll tell you today appears in that article, and the article is in the handout that you can download for this webinar. The article most recently appeared in the February 2015 issue of Modern Steel Construction magazine. And stalwart readers among you may even know that it first appeared as a three-part series in the January, February, and March issues in 1999. Uh, you can get a feel for how much has changed since then if you go on the AISC website, excuse me, the Modern Steel Construction Magazine website, and look in the archives. Uh, it's an interesting read to look back and see where we were. But thereafter, you'll also know we condensed it into one article and have updated it several times. There was a January 2004 update. There was another update in January of 2009, another in February of 2012, and the most recent one in February of 2015. Now the point of showing you this progression is to alert you. It's a recurring feature, and also that the information that we have on materials does change. We've settled into a three-year update cycle in our current plans. That's not cast in steel, but it gives you an idea of when to expect the next update. As you can see from the byline, the most recent installment of the article is also a joint project. My co-authors were my colleagues, Martin Anderson and Tom Schlafly, and I'd like to recognize their contributions to the article and also to what I'm sharing with you today by voice and slides. The spoken version of the article is just a little like, are you properly specifying materials live? It's a little clumsy with the punctuation, but my attention is drawn right away uh, from that and instead to the similarity uh, to what's happening in theater right now. Of course, I'm talking about SpongeBob the Musical, which is essentially like SpongeBob Live. How exciting is that? We'll try to make this just as exciting. I guess I'll have to wear the square pants. Martin is already doing his best Squidward impersonation. Personally, I think he nailed the Squidward smile. We are still trying to figure out, though, if Tom should be Patrick or Sandy Cheeks. But I suppose that's enough tomfoolery. Uh, we'll get back to the real McCoys now. Let's start by answering the question, why does it matter to specify materials properly? And any of you, Any of you who have seen The Matrix, uh, The Matrix taught us about the importance of a construct, told us that there is so much more going on behind everything we know and everything we do. It's certainly true of what we do. 
they said in the Matrix, you take the blue pill, the story ends, you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe, you take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. And if you look at our construct, it, it all starts with the steel construction manual, with the technical information that's placed in it, and now it's based upon a lot of things. The tree of roots that support it is vast and far-reaching. One important basis is the AISC specification. This is the 2010 version, which is still current. I suppose many of you already know that 2016 is an update year for this document. It's also an update year for the AISC seismic provisions, the AISC code of standard practice, and the AISC pre-qualified moment connection standard. These will all be available as free downloads on the AISC website later this fall. They'll also be printed in the 15th edition AISC Steel Construction Manual. That will be available in the summer of 2017. The third, edi third edition AISC Seismic Design Manual, that will be available in the summer of 2018. Now those documents depend on many others. And for materials, that includes the standards that ASTM publishes for materials. Shown here is the big book of ASTM standards, and there are so many standards in that big book, it really is an assembly of many volumes of standards, not just a single book. To ease that a little bit, uh, we deal with a lot of standards, but we deal with few enough that we can do a custom compilation. And ASTM publishes such a custom compilation for us. I'm showing you the 2013 cover in this slide. That version is still available in the AISC bookstore, but let me also tell you that we recently ordered the 2016 update to this compilation. We usually do it every two years. We waited an extra year this time because we wanted to have the standards in the form that they referenced in the 2016 AISC standards uh, and have everything as coordinated as possible. We actually expect to receive that update from ASTM this month. You'll see an announcement uh, through AISC email uh, and also on the AISC website when they're available. Uh, the cost for the custom compilation is $280 for AISC members. And I'll just point out that's a screaming deal if you compare it to the cost of the several volumes you'd need to get the same information from a, a set of uh, volumes of the ASTM Annual Book of Standards. The AISC compilation that ASTM produces for us contains about 60 standards, just a couple more than that. It includes all of the common standards uh, that we use in steel design and construction. And when you write a standard like ASTM A992 on your drawings or in your project specification, it gets you everything that makes the material what you expect based on what that standard provides in its requirements. Some people are students of ASTM standardization, and that takes a lot of reading if you are. I imagine there are fewer students than non-students. So let me pull back the curtain just a little bit on what is involved in an ASTM standard. Not all standards have the same information in ASTM standards. Some have more, some have less, some have different purposes. Nonetheless, in general, we can say that the typical ASTM standard for a structural steel material provides these things. It'll start with ordering requirements. It'll provide mechanical requirements like the yield strength, the tensile strength, and elongation requirements. It'll provide chemical composition requirements, process requirements, testing requirements, tolerances for the cross-section, the curvature of the member produced, and it, other things like that. It'll provide provisions for repair of defects and reporting requirements. Now, that's a lot of backup that you're able to get when you call out an ASTM standard simply by writing the name of the ASTM standard. And that's important. It's what everything is based on. Now, we also know we have many options. And they're collectively a lot, like this array of phone chargers. 
We need to have the right one. We need to have the one we need. And, uh, excuse me, the one we need and the right one for the device we want to charge if we're going to charge a phone. And we get into trouble when we don't have the right one. Well, this article and lecture is about having the right connection similarly for the materials that we use. So if we're right, it's a winning situation for sure. But how do we go about doing that? Well, that's what we're here to talk about today. One way, and it's in simplest form, I think, is to look at the AISC Code of Standard Practice and follow what's in it. More specifically, I'm talking about a table that's provided in Section 6.1.1. That table is intended for a different purpose. It's in the Material Identification section. And it is intended to simplify material identification in the shop and field by allowing that the standard grades for materials don't have to be specially marked. Since they're the preferred grade, that's what's going to be usual. We just require marking of other grades so that they can be properly differentiated. But if you take a step back, you'll see that this is really this table is really like a quick reference card of sorts. It shows you all of the preferred ASTM standards for the common materials. Note that I'm showing you the 2016 version of this table, and there are two changes to highlight from the previous version in the 2010 Code of Standard Practice. The first is that HP shapes, also called bearing piles, are now most commonly ASTM A572 grade 50 material. No longer is A36 the most common for them. The second is to note that hollow structural sections today are most commonly ASTM A500 grade C. We used to list uh, grade B, I'm sorry. Uh, they used to be most commonly grade B. Now I'll point you to the list of standards in this list that correspond to A36, uh, and I'll make a few more comments on that later. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, this listing, you must show one standard. You can't just list one or the other because it's an identification process, and you have to pick one or the other. But keep that in mind. We'll return to that later in the lecture. Now you also know that, or you likely know, that in part two of the AISC manual, we provide similar guidance that's more extensive on materials. In fact, that section of the manual has information that works hand in hand and is often coordinated with what we put in the article that we're discussing today. There's text that explains and tables that summarize. The tables best capture the visual illustration. So what I'll do today is use those and then make some specific comments. Let's look at the tables from the article and use those to start off. In each of the tables, what we've done is we've listed the ASTM standards down the left column, and then the products across the top of the table. There's dark shading for the preferred material. This tells you what ASTM standard you should be using in the typical case. It's the most commonly available material for that type of product. There also are other options for each product in many cases, if not most cases. That's the lighter shading to show which other ASTM standards are applicable to a specific product. You can always consider these alternatives, but we recommend that you talk to a fabricator or a supplier to make sure the cost and availability will meet your needs. So zooming in a little bit to the upper right of what I just showed you, you can see there's a table for the various structural shapes. There's a table for plates and bars. And there's a third table that covers structural fasteners. Now let me also add that there are some differences in today's live version from the article. Changes occur over time. Uh, we do the article every three years, which is, seems often enough. Things don't change that often, but things do change even in that time span. And you'll see some things that are different 
I'm going to highlight them as we talk today. I also want you to keep in mind that the documents I've pointed to so far get updated on different schedules. The ASTM standards can be updated yearly. That's why there are material changes even from a little over a year ago at this point. The AISC Code of Standard Practice is on a six-year cycle, as is the AISC Steel Construction Manual. These generally have the benefit, since we do both, that we uh, update the code in a cycle that leads into the manual cycle, and we coordinate them following the proper timeline. And uh, the feature article in Modern Steel Construction appears about every three years. We also provide specific articles when major changes occur in between. Ultimately, today's live webinar gives you a preview of what you'll see in the 15th edition AISC Steel Construction Manual. So with that, we'll dive into the deep end. We'll start by looking at structural shapes. And we can start with W shapes, but permit me a brief digression. I'm illustrating the W shape with a scan of a page from an early 1900s era Carnegie Steel Company handbook, long before they were called W shapes. But you see the graphic, and let me point out in case you aren't aware, maybe you are, maybe you aren't, we have scanned all of the old shape producer catalogs we have. We've also scanned all the old AISC manuals and standards we have. Anything in our library that we own, we've scanned, and we've put somewhere on, our, on the AISC website. Most often, you'll find this information linked at the page AISC.org slash EPUBs. And even better, AISC members can download these historic documents for free. Uh, at that link on the AISC website. So you'll see a page illustrating each of the shapes I talk about today. Um, these are all from documents that you can get access to right on the AISC website. Okay, so back to the lecture. W shapes today are almost all ASTM A992. I say almost because there's another grade to talk about later. And you can see the mechanical properties for A992 as shown on the slide. This is pretty uh, run of the mill for today. Everybody's used to this at this point. It's been a number of years since A992 took over. If you need atmospheric corrosion resistance, so-called weathering steel, uh, there is ASTM A588 that's available as an alternative. And if you need really big shapes, you may also want to think about that alternative grade. Here is Tom Schlafly holding a 3 16 inch thick sliver uh, of a W36 by 925. That, that little sliver weighs about 15 pounds, by the way. It also happens to be that alternative material that I mentioned, ASTM A913. It comes in four grades. I've focused on three uh, and shown on this slide here, grade 50, 65, and 70. This particular piece is from a grade 65 cross-section. Uh, the grade I've not shown is grade 60. Uh, ArcelorMittal has made quite a business providing this product for applications such as columns with lots of axial load, uh, long span truss cords, and similar applications. Although it isn't identified as the preferred material, there, there's a range over which it, it's, it is economical and not difficult to get. The range of availability is based upon minimum sizes as shown here. This is produced by a quenching and self-tempering process and there needs to be a minimum thickness in order to have enough heat inside the cooled outside uh, so that the quench uh, can actually self-temper with the heat that remains. And so you see the minimums here. Um, in column shapes, you're talking about 14 by 90 and up, W12 by 65 and up, W10 by 49 and up. And you can see in the, in the beam cross-sections, which probably for deflection and other limitations aren't going to be used as beams. Uh, maybe they will, but um, 
it's not often that strength controls a beam design anymore. So uh, these are likely to be used as column shapes. In fact, the piece Tom is holding in the picture uh, was sent to us by a fabricator who was welding two of them together to make a rather large uh, ton of foot column shape that was going to be used in a building just down the street from us here in Chicago. In any case, this reflects the information that's provided by ArcelorMittal, and my thanks to Shelley Finnegan of Arcelor for providing the information to me so that I could use it today. Uh, let me share a few other tidbits about this. One of the advantages of this grade is that preheat is not required for welding grades 50 and 65. Grade 70 still has a preheat requirement. Uh, secondly, and here is one of those updates from the 2015 article, we are adding grade 65 and 70 column tables in the 15th edition AISC manual reflecting the increased use of this product. Uh, finally, Arcelor is the current and common source for A913 product. We also have learned that Nucor Yamato plans to start making A913 product in the fall this year, and they'll ramp up their production into 2017. Let me also point you to this article in the December 2012 issue of Modern Steel Construction Magazine for some supporting information. It's in the PDF handout for the lecture as well. And now we'll leave W shapes and look at some other cross sections. OK, S shapes, or American Standard Beams, as they have been known. Uh, this is where we start to have a situation where 36 KSI product and 50 KSI product are about equally common in the marketplace. Earlier I pointed you to the table in the code, and that is still based on a 36 KSI product being the base if it's not identified as something different. Um, when there's two products that are equally prevalent in the marketplace, you still have to pick one for identification. We left it with A36. I expect by the next time we redo the article, we'll be able to just say, a 50 KSI grade. That's how it works. Things move forward in the marketplace. We reflect it. But for now, we say that these products are available A36 or a 50 KSI grade. And you can see the asterisks that I've put for the 50 KSI alternative to tell you what that is about. Uh, I'll show you that ASTMA star 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 could be A572 grade 50, A529 grade 50, or A992. And these all have similar properties. Um, it's just a question of what, what did the mill label the product. Sometimes it will have more than one of those grades on the label. Uh, but they're all 50 KSI products. Now here again, in S shapes, if you want atmospheric corrosion resistance, ASTM A588 is the standard. For M shapes or miscellaneous so-called light beams uh, in, the, in uh, uh, the past, M shape in the current terminology, uh, the story is pretty simple. It's essentially the same as S shapes. That actually makes it easy. In fact, as we go through some of the products here, we can uh, be very economical with time because it's similar a similar story for other products as well. Uh, channels are also called C shapes or MC shapes, and these also have a story for material grade that's very similar to S shapes. 36 KSI and 50 KSI being equally common. Now, one special product of note. And you may already know about this. Maybe you don't. If you don't, uh, let me tell you about it. This is a special MC shape that's made for a special purpose. This is the MC12 by 14.3. Some have taken to calling it the stringer channel because it's specifically configured to make stair stringers. The most important part of that is having a flange width that allows for a railing post to be welded and having enough room to make the weld. The flange width on this channel is 2 and an eighth inch wide. Uh, with other channels, you have to crimp the pipe or goober the weld around the overhang of the pipe past the flange. Uh, previously, you would have had to use a much larger C12 by 20.7 to get a wide enough flange. Uh, this is a common stringer section, and it will work for most stairs. So if you need it, um, 
now you know about it. Okay, angles, uh, L shapes. Uh, again, these are the same in the same situation as S shapes, where it's 36 or 50 being very common in the marketplace, equally common in the marketplace. Though I would like to call your attention to larger cross sections, 10 by 10 angles and 12 by 12 angles that now exist. This picture shows you a 12 by 12 with what is about a 3 by 2 and a half angle next to it. That and the quarter in the picture uh, will give you a feel for the scale. And again, thanks to ArcelorMittal for providing uh, this image. The thickness range you can see uh, for 10 by 10 goes from 3 quarters to 1 and 3 eighths. And for a 12 by 12, it goes from a 1 inch thickness to a 1 and 3 eighths inch thickness. All of this is defined, these shapes, uh, that is, are defined in ASTM A6, which actually is where all of these open shapes are defined for cross section. The strength is, is in the material standard, which references A6 for the cross sections. I'll also point out that information on large angles also was provided in the article I mentioned previously. Again, that's in your handout. T's are also a simple case because they are derived from products we've already talked about. WT's are split or cut for W shapes. MT's are split or cut from M shapes. ST's are split or cut from S shapes. So we follow the material guidance from the parent product for our T's. Now, HP shapes, I mentioned a little about them before. Uh, they're also called bearing piles. I already tipped you off a little bit about this. They're most commonly A572 grade 50 in the marketplace today. Here again, uh, we have a case where there are much bigger HP sections than we used to have. We used to stop at HP 14s. Now we have HP 16s and 18s. This is an HP 16 that Thatcher Foundations drove to rock in their yard. Uh, my thanks to Mike Waisaki of Thatcher Foundations for sharing the picture. Again, a little further information on the big HP shapes is available in the article I mentioned. Now let's look at hollow structural sections, or HSS as we call them. We'll start with rectangular cross sections. We have to talk about rectangular and round separately at the start. Um, rectangular is a category that also includes square. These are most commonly ASTM A500 grade C. I mentioned that earlier. It has a 50 KSI yield strength. Now, in round, uh, the story is just slightly different. It's the same grade, ASTM A500, grade C is most common again. But note the yield strength is lower. It's 46 KSI for rounds, not 50 KSI, like for rectangular HSS. There is an atmospheric corrosion resistant grade for hollow structural sections. ASTM A847 provides for this. and if you didn't know this already, it's essentially just like ASTM A588. In fact, A847 hollow structural sections are manufactured from A588 plate. Let me also add um, that we have a new product in the HSS marketplace. This is an article on it, ASTM A1085. It appeared in the September 2013 issue of Modern Steel Construction Magazine. And again, I've put this article in the PDF handout you have for this lecture. HSS manufacturers are doing their best to make this product available to you, including Atlas Tube and Independence Tube, who are AISE member HSS manufacturers. My thanks to Brad Fletcher of Atlas Tube for providing this construction photo. Uh, of Big River Steel, a new wide flange mill being constructed in Arkansas. It's predominantly built with hollow structural sections and large cross sections at that. Here you can see a little more, but perhaps you still don't have the scale uh, from the picture uh, quite enough. I'll just tell you the verticals you see are HSS 24 by 12 
cross-sections. Now, larger means a lot of things. Uh, in A1085 and A500, uh, both now allow, uh, I should say A1085 allows and A500 now allows, an 88-inch periphery and a 7 8 maximum wall thickness. This is an increase for ASTM A500, which used to limit uh, size to 64-inch periphery and 0.688-inch wall thickness. Uh, secondly, this allows larger uh, walls on rectangular and square cross sections. Squares can be 18, 20, and 22 inch in size, and rectangles are commonly 16 by 12, 20 by 12, and 24 by 12 in current production. There also is a second new standard I should mention. Uh, that can be considered when large cross-sections are desired, ASTM A1065. This covers up to a 192-inch periphery and a 1-inch wall thickness. And this is a slightly different approach to production. This is where two C-shapes are made at a plate, and then they're welded together. And that's specifically covered in A1065. And that's how come it can be so much bigger. If you'd like further information on these, there's an article for that, too. For, for information, see this article that I'm showing you, which was in the November 2011 issue of Modern Steel Construction. Again, it's in the PDF handout that we've provided for the lecture. Now, let me back up a little bit and give you a few more details on ASTM A1085. One key point is that it has the same mechanical properties with FY of 50 KSI for both round and rectangular cross sections. So it doesn't change when we go from rectangular to round in A1085 material. Another feature is that the wall thickness tolerance is smaller than for A500. So where we have to reduce the wall thickness by 7% when we design with an ASTM A500 product, we do not have to do that for ASTM A1085 product. Uh, I'll add we don't have to do that for a 1065 product either, and these will be reflected in the 2016 version of the AISC specification, um, which is winding its way through typesetting and publication right now. Another feature is A1085 has a maximum tensile strength. This helps to increase the ductility of the material. It also keeps seismic design factors, RY and RT, uh, lower. And a final item to point out about A1085 is that it has a specified toughness value. And this is of benefit because it allowed us to eliminate the restriction that's written into ASTM A500 uh, against use in dynamically loaded welded structures, essentially bridges. Uh, can't use A500 without doing something special. A1085 could be used because it has inherent toughness specified in the standard. Now, we like this material a lot, but I'll re reiterate that ASTM A500 grade C is still more common in the marketplace, and you should talk to your fabricator about A1085 if you want to use it. You also could contact Atlas Tube, an independence tube, and I'm sure they will be very helpful to you if you do. Let's move on a little bit, still in a hollow cross-section, but I'll talk about steel pipe now. Steel pipe is made to ASTM A53 grade B, and you can see the mechanical properties. It has a yield strength of 35 KSI. That's lower than we have for round, hollow structural sections. And let me expand on that a little bit. It's important to note that round, hollow structural sections and steel pipe are not identical and are not interchangeable as products. They're made to different ASTM standards, A500 grade C being most common for round HSS, A53 grade B being most common uh, the only standard, actually, for steel pipe. They also have different strength levels. The yield strength for round HSS is 46 KSI. 
the yield strength for steel pipe is 35 KSI. There's also a different system of designation as well. The hollow structural section designation has uh, decimals for round, decimals to three places. That incidentally also differs from how rectangular HSS are specified. Those use fractional uh, designation form when they have fractions. But round HSS, the one I'm illustrating here, HSS 5.563 by 0 0.258. Compare that to the steel pipe designation, pipe 5 standard, very different. Now, I should also point out that there are some similarities. In fact, the two designations shown here, HSS 5.563 by 0 0.258, and pipe 5 standard have the same physical cross-section. So uh, this is another tidbit I, I would like to note. Round HSS are most commonly stocked and available in the cross-sections that match up with pipe cross-sections. Unless you know you can get the others, and by that I mean all the other round HSS cross-sections, I suggest you should avoid specifying non-pipe cross-sections in hollow structural sections. Now that sounds difficult to do, and maybe I've confused you, but let me tell you the easy way to do it. If you look at the diameter that's in the HSS designation. All of the round HSS cross sections that match pipe cross sections have non-zero numbers after the decimal point in the diameter. And that's the indicator that it matches a pipe cross section. There are other HSS cross sections that have 0 .000 in the diameter, and those are the ones that don't match up with pipe cross sections. And a second, uh, uh, an extra tidbit, this didn't appear in the original article. Uh, let me alert you that ASTM A513 is not a useful pipe standard for our needs. Uh, this seems to be common for some reason in handrails. The fundamental problem, though, is that the ASTM A513 standard does not include a minimum strength level. It can be specified but none of the stock that's sitting in yards or depots has been ordered to a specific strength level. Why it happens with some regularity, I don't know. Uh, I'm just alerting you that it's a problem. And my thanks to Ben Baer of Sheffy Lulkin and Associates for being the first to point this out to me. Now let's talk a little bit about plates and bars. And we can distinguish between the two uh, by saying that plates are generally wide with faces rolled and bars are generally narrower with faces and edges rolled. Plates come from a plate mill and bars come from a bar mill. But in terms of the material grades, we can say the same things apply to both products. And here we also have a situation where 36 KSI product and 50 KSI product are about equally common in the marketplace. For 36 KSI product, it's ASTM A36 material. For 50 KSI product, it's A572 grade 50 material. Now, I've added a couple asterisks here to discuss. For A36 plate, that 36 KSI value is only good up to 8 inches. Maybe only isn't the right word. 8 inches is pretty thick. Uh, after that, the strength drops to 32 KSI. For A572 grade 50, the maximum thickness covered is 4 inches. Okay, So there's a few limitations there. Here again, uh, our old standby ASTM A588 is the atmospheric corrosion resistance uh, product uh, material specification, excuse me. Now we'll switch to fasteners, and our, that's our next topic. And mostly, this means we're going to talk about bolts. Oops. There we go. Slide didn't advance. Now we're used to standards like ASTM A325 and A490. We also have gotten fairly used to the tension control twist off form of these bolts, ASTM F1852 and F2280. Now you may or may not be aware that these standards and their metric alternatives have myriad inconsistencies, differences, conflicts, 
and other subtle and not so subtle variations. And a gentleman named Chad Larson, who uh, runs the Lejeune Bolt Company, came to the rescue. He led the creation of an umbrella standard that makes them all consistent and integrates them into a single standard, ASTM F3125. And those of you who know Chad know he's a particularly smart person. He also had the foresight to tie the new to the old in a very direct and unmistakable way. The previously separate products are identified as grades. So you have grade A325, grade A490, grade F1852, and grade F2280. This is an easy adaptation that will not trip you up as the transition occurs in the marketplace. I'll also alert you to two new standards for higher strength bolting products. ASTM F3111 is a 200 KSI structural bolt that's available as heavy hex. And F3043 is a TC version of that. Uh, these bolts have strict environmental requirements that are discussed in the standards. Essentially, they mean that they can't get wet. They must always remain dry and free from contact with corrosive chemicals. This is primarily due to their high strength and uh, hydrogen embrittlement concerns. These bolts are proprietary, not produced domestically. Uh, so if you have an application with large connections that you think that these might help, talk to your fabricator and make sure you can obtain them if you want to try them. Now looking quickly at other fastener products, and mostly these flow from what we choose for bolts. But for A560, I'm sorry, for structural nuts, A563 is the preferred material specification. It's a heavy hex nut. The appropriate grade and finish is specified in the table in that standard according to the bolt that it's going to be used with. And for steel to steel structural bolting applications, you can also get a summary of the appropriate grade and finish in section 2.4 of the Research Council on Structural Connections, RCSC specification. It's a free download from the RCSC website, which is boltcouncil.org. Moving on to washers, the preferred material specification is ASTM F436. This specification provides for both flat and beveled washers. Uh, it used to only cover a 532nds inch thick um, F436 washer, but recently an extra thick option was added to provide for those cases in the RCSC specification where oversized and slotted holes occur in an outer ply. And the table in, in part six of the RCSC specification requires uh, twice the thickness. And then finishing up on this slide, uh, for DTIs, when bolted joints are specified as pretensioned or slip critical, and the direct tension indicator pretensioning method is used. We look at ASTM F959 DTIs. Uh, the use of the device conforms to the requirements in RCSC's specification, uh, specifically the installation ver pre installation verification required in Section 7, the installation required in Section 8, and the inspection required in Section 9. There is an alternative permitted, uh, alternative indicating devices can be used according to section 2.6.2 and sometimes manufacturers provide these and would like you to use those provisions instead. Let's talk now about anchor rods, which I'll say now are not bolts. Uh, we're normally talking about ASTM F1554. That is the pref preferred material specification for anchor rods. It covers hooked, headed, and threaded and nutted anchor rods, and it provides three strength grades, 36, 55, and 105. It's most commonly specified as grade 55, although grades 36 and 105 are normally available. Section 4.1 in ASTM F1554 provides that when grade 36 is ordered, the supplier can substitute a weldable grade 55 at their option. Grade 36 may be weldable, uh, I'm sorry, is weldable. Uh, grade 55 requires a supplement uh, to be weldable. And grade 105 generally is not weldable. Now there's some recent improvements that I should tell you about. 
that have been made to ASTM F1554. They were marshaled by Toby Anderson of Bay Bolt and are summarized in this article from the January 2016 issue of Modern Steel Construction Magazine. Again, it's a PDF. It's in the PDF handout. And the intrepid among you are already noticing that I said anchor rods and not bolts. And here is a title, an article about ASTM F1554, and it says bolts. Uh, ASTM practices and AISC practices with terminology differ. And so you'll just have to adapt with me to properly apply the information. It's the same in the end. We're talking about rods that are headed, nutted, or hooked in any case. This article tells you about great changes in the F1554 product. Material ductility has been increased so that grades 36 and 55 meet ACI ductile anchor definition automatically. And grade 105 can be specified to do so in the ordering requirements. The improvements also better address production by cold drawing to measure properties after the drawing is done, not before. They reduce the maximum carbon values to improve weldability, and they add heading dimensions automatically in the standard. Now, just a brief mention of anchor rod washers. In anchor rod and other embedment applications, hole sizes generally are larger than those for steel-to-steel -steel structural bolting applications. You get those holes out of Table 14.2 in the AISC manual. And that's the kind of thing that we're talking about here. They're, they're specified in that table with minimum thickness and minimum size. And sometimes, uh, depending on your application, you, you may need to do further design on those washers but they're generally made from plate or bar. Now, let me also share a development that I think is very significant. Your minions have been working together and effectively for you. ACI 117 has modified their tolerances for placement of anchors in concrete. The AIC Code of Standard Practice has modified its tolerances for anchor rods and the hole sizes you'll see in the 15th edition AISC manual have also been coordinated with those changes. The work was led in all three groups by Mike West of Computerized Structural Design, and he coordinated it all in a fashion such that anchor rods that are placed by the concrete contractor to 117 tolerances will receive a base plate that is fabricated to the tolerances in the code of standard practice and using the holes given in the AISC manual. I'm thinking this is a Ron Burgundy kind of big deal. I mean, imagine if this is the end of fit problems at column bases. I certainly hope it is. So let's talk briefly about welds. Perhaps I really should say filler metals if we're talking about products. And most commonly, you're going to find that you're dealing with uh, an electrode that has a strength level of 70 KSI. Anything other that than that, and I suggest you talk to your fabricator. This is the generic form of the expression using FEXX. In reality, that generalizes a lot of options in the welding world. I won't go into those in detail. I'll just point you to AISC Design Guide 21, which was written by Dwayne Miller of Lincoln Electric Company. It's a free download on the AISC website for AISC members. Let me also alert you to one recent development, AWS A5.36. We see from time to time project specifications that still call out something like AWS A5.1, A5.5. These references are often wrong because they're specific to the process of stick welding, which is not likely to be used today in a shop. Recent changes have been aimed at helping to get the right specifications and cover other uh, processes. So I recommend that you also include AWS A5.36 as a reference. It's titled Specification for Carbon and Low Steel, excuse me, Low Alloy Steel Flux Cord Electrodes for Flux Cord Arc Welding and Metal Cord Electrodes for Gas Metal Arc Welding. It was intended to supersede A520 and A529 but those AWS standards have not yet been withdrawn. Uh, all three are actually still addressed in AWS D1.1.15. Now, just a couple odds and ends before we wrap up. There is information in the article that covers all of the products that you see here. I'll just refer you to the article for those rather than 
uh, restating everything that's stated in there. There's also some information on bridges. And the point about bridges is uh, almost everything in bridges uses ASTM A709. And the information in the article will tell you how that corresponds. Generally, all the other grades have been integrated um, into A709 as subgrades of A709. And although it's intended for bridges, you can still substitute the material because it's equal or better to any of the uh, uh, parent standards that we would normally specify for a building. Okay, so we're back with our construct, and you're still with me, so I thank you for taking the red pill. We now have all the right connectors and have properly connected them, which means you can be right and happy. And being right and happy, usually you don't get to be both at the same time. It is said you can either be right or be happy, usually by those uh, counselors that you go talk to when you're unhappy. But today we have the rare exception. When we properly specify the materials we use in design and construction, we get to be both right and happy. And I should add that we also don't have to spend time solving problems and chasing materials that may be unavailable or more expensive, or even then find an alternative when we can't find them. So we also get the bonuses of being fast and economical, too. I thank you for your attention today, and you stay classy, San Diego. Thank you, Charlie. Um, let's jump into some questions. Uh, we have quite a few today, so we'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, the first question, can you speak to the shift from A500 grade B to grade C in terms of the most commonly available material for HSS? And how long do you think it will be before the, all the supplies of grade B are gone? OK, well, that's a question that um, we need a little more information for. Most hollow sections flow to a fabricator through a steel service center. And what service centers do is they, they don't want to stock multiple products. And hollow section manufacturers got very smart and realized that they could provide one product that meets both grade B and grade C, and they began dual labeling. So no matter what anybody ordered, they can provide it from their, uh, their stock. Well, service centers are now stocking product that meets both. So whatever anybody specifies, essentially, when we realized that was happening with hollow sections, and you can take advantage of the higher strength, there, there's no reason not to take advantage of it. Um, and so that's, that's what caused the change from where we were with grade B to where we are now with grade C. In essence, I, I think you've been seeing it for quite some time. And it's not a case where the stock is going to have to be exhausted. We've made the change reflecting practice of what we see on the floor in service centers right now. So there's no lag time. It's happening right now. OK, thank you, Charlie. The next question, for round HSS versus steel pipe, could you discuss the cost difference and which one would be more cost effective? Um, I don't have cost values for both. You can usually get a cost sheet. Uh, depending on what product you're talking about, you can see costs. Uh, as an example, you can go on the new Core Yamato website right now and download their cost sheet, um, which will show you values uh, for W shapes. Uh, you can get similar cut sheets from uh, pipe producers, uh, service centers also. Uh, but I don't have, a, I don't have a, a figure in my head for the comparative cost between the two. What we usually see um, is A53 um, and A500 being about equally used. So it, it must be that the costs are very comparable. So I suggest you talk to a, a service center. That's where the product is going to come. There is a list of AISC serv uh, member service centers on the AISC website with contact information. And you'd be best to get that information directly from them. OK, thank you, Charlie. Uh, for the next question, I'm going to take us to slide 58. We had a couple questions about 
the different grades of this ASTM A913. In the Modern Steel Construction article, uh, grade 60 is also listed. Could you discuss the different grades that are available? Right. Well, the, the grade 50, grade 65, and grade 70 are the three that I highlighted on the slide. In, in words, I mentioned grade 60. Um, the most commonly used grade of A913 that I've seen has been 65. I think where people have used A913 grade 50 has been in cases where they would like to uh, take advantage of the preheat uh, or the, 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 um, the, the lack of a need for preheat when welding grade 50. Uh, I don't think there's been much use of grade 60. That doesn't mean it couldn't be used, but I think the primary focus has been on grade 65. We now see some grade 70 being used as well. Uh, in terms of A913, I think going forward what you're going to see is product either in 50 or 65, 70 when you can uh, justify the, say, the added cost, uh, particularly of the welding with preheat. Okay, thank you. The next question, um, we will be discussing A1085 steel versus A500. We have a couple questions about using the thickness versus 0.93 of the thickness. Could you expand on this concept again? Yes. Um, when you look at A500, it has a, a, a wall thickness tolerance of about 10% and actual production is pretty close to that. And long ago, um, several versions of the AISC specification ago, we introduced a, a factor 0.93 times the thickness. Um, A1085 was created as a way to eliminate the need to do that. It, it has a tighter tolerance, 5% uh, tolerance, which brings it very close to the variation you'll get, say, on a W shape in terms of cross-sectional area. And there's no need to apply that 7% reduction, the 0.93 factor on the thickness when doing the calculations when using A1085. It's a big plus for the, for the, for the material. Uh, we'd love it to take off in the marketplace. What I've shown you here and told you about reflects what we actually see with A500 grade C being still more common, uh, it doesn't change that we would love to see uh, A1085 take off and uh, uh, take over. Okay, thank you. And next we'll move on to the topic of bolts. When specifying an ASTM standard for bolts, do you also need to specify N or X bolts? So A325, A490, uh, those products uh, completely describe the fastener that you're going to get. Now it's F3125, grade A325, grade A490. The N or X condition is, is purely something that happens from the way you decide to design it and how you configure the plies of the grip. There's actually an article in the Engineering Journal uh, written by your esteemed speaker on uh, uh, specifying uh, bolt length and uh, how to exclude or uh, otherwise you're allowing the threads to be included. And uh, it's purely, it's the same fastener in either one, same fastener for a slip critical joint. Uh, some people think that you have to specify in your purchasing A325N, A325X, A325SC. I guarantee you that the person receiving the order at the bolt uh, company uh, laughs a little bit when he sees it or she sees it, but uh, it's not necessary to do that when you order the product. You just order a A325, and now you'll order grade A325 from F3125. Okay, thank you. And for the next question, are any of the new high-strength bolts weldable? Bolts generally uh, should not be welded. Uh, I'm not sure why you would want to weld them. They're made to go together using the threads and a nut, washers. Uh, I guess sometimes we 
uh, might try to tack the heads to something. I, I, I've seen cases, but those should be pretty rare. Uh, you've got high strength fasteners that have heat treatment and I would be very cautious about welding on them. Okay, uh, the next question. For most shapes that are equally present in the marketplace as 50 KSI or 36 KSI, is there a price difference? There can be, and I suppose it would matter uh, what shape we're talking about. Here again, uh, for price, absolutely the best thing to do. The information is commonly on producer websites right now. Uh, you can download their, uh, uh, their, their cost structure and you'll see what a, what a mill is charging when someone buys the steel. And you can see the, the variations. Uh, it's interesting that uh, the, the upcharges for stronger material these days often don't keep pace with the increase in strength. You pay uh, comparatively less for the increase in strength is what we see. But you, ha you have to look at the, at the uh, information the, uh, the mills provide, it can change, it does change, just like the requirements in the standards change. Mills update their pricing periodically, and you've got to, you've got to be responsive to that. Uh, I can't give you a general rule or state prices uh, in the lecture. Okay, thank you, Charlie. And we have one more question, and I don't know if you know the answer to this or if you might have to conjecture. What is the single most common misspecification with regard to steel material? A325 anchor bolts. So I think we still see that a lot. Uh, I, that's why I tried to highlight that uh, anchor rods are not bolts. And uh, that's another place where somebody laughs and um, they just make it out of A449 um, and they make it as long as you specified it. And uh, um, people think that they, they got A325 anchor bolts. So uh, you know, pay attention to the material specification, make it proper, and uh, uh, you can stop people from laughing. Another benefit I forgot to add. Okay, thank you, Charlie. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have today for questions. There are quite a few unanswered questions, so we will respond to you by email with an answer.